Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about selections. This is following up on my previous two videos about the vector math nodes. Those videos went over some of the operations you can use to manipulate vectors. This video is going to talk about how you can separate out parts of your mesh or select certain things that you want to apply those vectors to or other operations. I assume most people are already sort of familiar with the selection. But just in case you aren't, um, on most of the green geometry nodes um, with the green headers, there is a selection, pink selection boolean option. Um, it's not on all of them, like if you add a realize instances, it doesn't have any. So it's not all of them, but I think it's fair to say that most of the green nodes have a selection input. Obviously that selection input is a boolean value and it can be true or false per element that you're working on. So that's really all there is to say about what the selection is. Um, there's no other like specific settings for um, the selection itself. Um, all there is is that the fact that you can plug any nodes you want into that selection socket, which means there's basically infinite possibilities for how you could make a selection. And I was kind of scratching my head a little bit trying to figure out how to break it down as simple as possible. What I'm trying to say is, I'm not going to be able to cover every way you could possibly select something in this video, but what I do want to do is try to go over some of the ways that I use a lot that I think are the most useful, and um, maybe some categories of, I sort of have these broken up into categories of ways of selecting things. Alright, as a first um, example of sort of a category of ways you can select things, I have the circle here, which we'll try to extrude into a bowl sort of shape. Um, and one thing to point out is, is these are all pretty simple, kind of silly examples, but the sort of way of selecting things, um, if you can think of it generally, can be applied to anything. And I think it's sort of trying to build up that library of ways of selecting things so that, so that you have them available to you when you have a problem and you're like, oh, I need to select this part of a mesh, or um, that you can come up with a way to do that. So one of the sets of input nodes that are available to you are all of the neighbor nodes. There's a vertex, edge, and face neighbors node. And they all output counts of, for that element, um, for each vertex, how many edges are adjacent to that vertex, um, things like that. And so one of the useful ways to use that is to um, say how many faces are adjacent to an edge, because if only one face is adjacent to an edge, then you know it's, that's a boundary edge. Now, the easiest way to preview a selection is with the separate geometry node. So um, that's easy to add. Just add, search for separate geometry, put it in there. You can pick whatever mode you want. So we want edge in this case, and then just plug your Boolean value into the selection, and then you can preview it and the opposite, which is helpful sometimes. So if you just want to see what you're working with, I would recommend just adding temporarily a separate geometry node. It'll let you see what you're working with, and then you can plug the Boolean into your extrude in this case. So then we can extrude from this, we can extrude the only the boundary edge upwards, and then we can extrude that again if we want, taking the top and using that as the selection. So that's something to note too. Some of the, it's confusing to say geometry nodes, but the green nodes, the geometry nodes in the, um, so red nodes are like inputs, blue nodes do like operations, purple nodes are to do with vectors, green nodes work on geometry. It's the green nodes that might have the selection sockets, and sometimes those green geometry nodes output, a sele output some selections as well, particularly the extrude node here. Uh, the boolean also has like uh, intersecting edges sometimes. And so just something to, to be aware of that those preset um, selections can be used as well and are often pretty useful. So that's the first example. The neighbor input nodes are a useful way to get a selection. Um, I guess I should also mention the compare node. This is the compare node. Um, it's used in probably most selections. You can search for it under equal or um, not equal or greater than. That's the easiest way to find it. But it's, it's called the compare node. Compare. And the compare node is useful because you can do greater than, less than um, operations on these counts to, depending on what it is you're trying to select and stuff. All right, the second kind of category I thought of was selections that were based on the index node. Note again, we have a red input node, the sort of the basis of the selection. Then we do some blue operations on it, and then eventually plug that into a ge green geometry node. That pattern is going to be pretty standard for most ways of selecting things. 
So here we're making a selection based on the index. The problem with selections based on the index is um, they're really only reliable if you're creating the geometry also within the geometry node. If you're using um, geometry that you can edit as your input, then there's really no way to guarantee what the order of the indexes of the faces or whatever will be. So here we have a grid, and we know that the faces in the grid will all be indexed starting at zero and then counting up like so. So because we know that, we can do some math and convert these numbers into a true or false value. And so one way we can do that is we could look at the faces. If we do the faces modulo 2, which will either be 0 or 1, we can plug that into the selection here as a boolean. And then if we look at that, we'll be able to move every other row, essentially, independent of the other rows. So that would be one way to use it. Another thing you could do is you could do something a little more complicated. We could divide, since there's eight faces across, we could divide that by eight and floor it, so it will count up by one each time. Then we could add that to the index. So each face in a higher row will have its column offset by one compared to the previous row. And then if we do modulo two on that and apply a different material to it, we'll get a checkerboard texture. So once again, there's probably infinite different ways you could combine math nodes to convert the index into a selection. Um, those are a couple of examples. Again, the pattern to notice is you have a red node, you do some blue operations to it. Those can be simple or as complex as you want. And then in the end, you get a Boolean value that you plug into the selection. All right, I've got a third example here. This one's based on the length of the edges. So I have this node group here. Notice again, we start with at the beginning with a red input node. This time it's the edge vertices and we're subtracting the two edge vertices from each other and then we're taking the length of that vector. That tells us how far apart the two points are. So now that we have the length of that vector, we could compare, we could calculate what the average length of all of the vectors in the, or all of the edges in the mesh are. And we could say, is our edge, the current edge that we're looking at greater than the average edge in the whole mesh? And if that's true, we can do something like subdividing that edge. So now you can see the long edges got a point added in the middle, whereas the short edges are still the same length, could do it again. Now there's more edges and you keep doing that iteratively and end up where everything starts to converge towards being the same length. Now, obviously this particular example, um, you wouldn't ever need to do because it would be a lot easier just to convert these lines to curves and then resample the curve with the resample, with the resample curve node. But um, sometimes it's hard to think of good examples for selections, I guess. But again, the main point is um, we have a red input node. We do some operations to it, do a greater than compare. That gets us a Boolean value, and we are able to do something using um, a, a selection that's based on the length of the edge being greater than some value. All right, so this last example is a lot more thought out. It's sort of the idea if you had a, this terrain, how could you um, improve and add features to that terrain um, using sort of procedural tools? And in the process of doing that, we're going to want to make quite a few different selections. So the first one we sort of looked at in the last video when we were talking about the dot product. And that's, um, we might want to take these cliff faces and add a little extra detail to them. So we have our input geometry here. If we take the normal, notice again, red input vector, we do some operations, greater than compare, goes into the green geometry node input as a selection. So if we have the normal dot product with up, we can say if it's greater than some threshold, in this case 0.7, we want to select those faces. So now we split our mesh into the cliffs and the not cliffs. Then we could do some things to that. Um, we could triangulate it. One thing I should mention for a, that's a useful selection just to know about is um, you can do a random. And you can choose what the likelihood of a face in this case being selected is. So you can see that here, if you turn it down, more of it becomes the inverted. So random value is a good option sometimes. In this case, I wanted it to be random, but a little more chunky. So I did a noise texture instead. And if the noise texture's value is greater than 0.5, then that'll be one part. And, um, and so then if you change the scale, you can sort of make it more or less contiguous. So that's another useful random selection noise texture into greater than, or just if you just want it really random, just a random Boolean value with a probability 
Both of those are good options. Then we can take these faces that we've separated out here and we can extrude them just along their normal. And then if we join that all, all parts of that back into the original mesh, we have the um, same mesh we started with, but with a lot more detail in the cliffs. Then we can merge everything back together and smooth out a little bit. So we started with, uh, we started with this, now we have this. A lot more detail, I think. So now, um, another way you might want to make a selection is based on some other geometry. So here I have this path I drew. It's just a mesh I extruded out, um, snapping it to the surface. And for that, I have this road modifier that looks at that object. So I have the, that road object coming as, as object info. Then we can do a geometry proximity. So notice again, red input node. This time um, we have this extra proximity to get a sample off of that other object. Um, and then compare with the less than. So we're getting the distance for all of the points in our mesh to this line that we drew. And if the distance is less than 0 0.07, we'll include it in the selection. So that looks like this versus that. And then in this case, I don't actually want to separate it. That's just a preview. We're just going to store that distance value on the... Uh, as a named attribute and use it in the shader to draw this brown color where the road should be. So that's pretty cool. Um, another thing you might want to do for a selection, I kind of also mentioned this one as the bad way of doing the dot product selection, um, but sometimes it's useful. It's just based on height. So here we could add a lake, add some water in this low spot, um, and add it anywhere that is down low. So we could come over here pull this down and we should get water over here as well. So that's cool because it's procedural and updates as you make edits to the mesh and stuff. And all we're doing here is again, red, um, red input, doing some comparisons to it. This time it's just the position. We're looking at the Z value of the position vector. And if it, the Z value is less than 1.1, um, we're separating that out. Then we just flatten it. So it's a, Plane. Then it's just setting the material, um, cleaning up again. Here again, we, we're using the edge neighbors as a selection um, to delete some stuff. So if you look here, there's some of these artifacts. So we could say if there's no edges around a face, so face count equals zero, delete those. So that's a selection based on the height of the object on the Z axis. Then um, we could do some other things. So here we have this input geometry. It's just a sort of a plane. And that's defining an area that we want forest to appear on our underlying terrain mesh. And so to do that, we might want to make a bunch of different selections with different sorts of rules. So the first one might just be, uh, we might want to add some random pockets to it. That's our random noise selection we looked at earlier. So we don't want it to appear in some places, so we'll just get rid of some areas. And then um, we only want it to appear where we defined our our plane because we want to be able to control it so we want that selection and then we don't want it to appear on the cliffs so we might as well remove all of the cliffs and that's using our dot product method of selecting and then um, we don't want it to appear on the road because you don't want to drive into a you don't want to drive into a tree so let's take the road out of the equation and then finally uh, we don't want trees growing in the water because that uh, doesn't usually happen so then all of those are different selections, and they're all ones that are useful for what we're trying to do with the trees. To combine them all together, you can just use the Boolean math and operation. And you can just chain them all together. So we have our noise selection and our ray cast against our uh, forest control. And then we take the result of that and end it with the dot product selection. We take the result of that and end it with our roads selection. We take the combination of those and put that into an and where we look at the position, which is how we get the water selection. And then all of those together look like this. And that's our selection for where we want to place our trees. So then we can put that into a distribute points on faces node, which looks like this. And then we can scatter trees on those points, and then we can merge that back into our terrain. So there you go. That's what I've come up with to say about selection so far. Um, hopefully it was useful and gave you some ideas of ways you can make selections. 
Like I said, there's infinite ways you could make selections and they're all probably useful for something. I think the main thing to keep in mind is it's probably gonna follow the pattern of you have some red input node or you're reading some attribute off of your geometry data. You're gonna do some operations to that. It's gonna go into a compare node to convert it to a boolean and then that boolean goes into the selection on a green geometry nodes node. So hopefully all of those examples made sense and I was able to cover some of the more useful ones. Um, if you have ways of selecting things that you think are very useful, feel free to mention those or if you have questions about how you could select something, feel free to ask. And other than that, that's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching.